PTA would like to welcome you here this evening for Meet the Candidate Night. I'd like to introduce Ms. Eileen O'Reilly. She is the president of the Putnam County League of Women Voters, and she will start our evening off. trustee candidates, I can't even read tonight. Our league will be moderating tonight's forum, a little information about the League of Women Voters. We're a nonpartisan, grassroots political organization open to men and women. We encourage informed and active participation in government and work to increase understanding of major public policy issues. The league neither supports nor opposes any political party or candidate for elective office. I'm pleased to introduce tonight's moderator, Mark Pikowski. Mark is a resident of Mayapac and a 25-year veteran public school music teacher in the Yonkers school system. A firm believer in community and public service, Mr. Pikowski has served on numerous advisory councils, most notably as an advocate for public education and arts in education. He has been a Board of Education trustee for the Mayapac Public Schools and is currently serving his 10th year, a little more than that I think, as a member of the Putnam Arts Council Board of Directors. Mark has been a member of the League of Putnam County, League of Women Voters of Putnam County for nine years and is currently on the Board of Directors of the League. Let's have a round of applause for our moderator tonight. So nice to everybody out tonight, and of course nice, I think, also is that tonight, uh, I think we're going to have less of a debate than more of a informational get to know these two candidates, as I'm informed that they are both running unopposed for their seats on the Booster Board of Education. So, I have a few comments I must make as performed. Uh, first of all, uh, as I did said, I am on uh, the work of the League of Women Voters. League of Women Voters is not just for women, and we urge you all to consider joining the League of Women Voters and getting involved in this public service. Now, I will be the moderator for tonight's event. I am not a willing member of this community, and I apologize in advance if I mispronounce anybody's name. We're here to listen to the candidates who are seeking election, and it's important that we give each candidate the opportunity to make the best use of the time allotted for this program. So I request that you refrain from applause during the program as it will take up their allotted time uh, that we can use to hear from the candidates. Index cards were handed out to you as you entered the auditorium for you to write out your questions. Additional cards are available uh, if needed. Uh, and if you have a question, uh, please write it down and one of our lead volunteers will collect them from you. Uh, the questions will be vetted before handed to me. Uh, and you are advised that questions posed to the candidates may not be personal in nature and are to address the position that the candidate is seeking. Throughout the debate, or informational meeting, uh, no comments of a personal or abusive nature will be permitted and will be ruled out of order. No calling out or hecking will be tolerated, and those who cannot conduct themselves properly will be asked to leave the room. At this time, we request that you turn off all your cell phones, as I am allowed to do myself. Um, and uh, videotaping or personal videotaping of tonight's meeting is not permitted. So allow me to introduce at this time the candidates for this year's Booster Central School District Board of Education Trustee. There are two available seats, and the candidates are Mr. Christopher Ferrari and Mr. Scott Seaman. Give them a round of applause. Due to the lack of opposition tonight, I think that we can all relax a little bit, but there are some basic ground rules that we'll use as a framework for our meeting tonight. Uh, for all statements by the candidates, our timekeepers, Ms. Phyllis Honig and Ms. Jane Weiss, uh, will notify the speaker when 30 seconds remain by holding up a yellow sign. And again, when the time is up, by holding up a red sign. Our timekeepers are, as I said, are members of the League of Women Voters of Public County. Uh, the order of the speakers has been determined by a coin toss, and uh, each candidate will give a two-minute opening statement, 
and then we will reverse the order for our closing statements. Um, Mr. Seaman won the time clause and has elected to allow Ms. Barari to give her opening remarks first. Ms. Barari. Thank you. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Krista Barari, and I have two children in the uh, Brewster schools. My son is in eighth grade at Henry Wells, and my daughter is a senior at Brewster High School. Uh, she's graduating this year, and uh, she just committed to University of Delaware. We're very excited. Go Blue Hens. Um, we've lived in Brewster uh, for almost 20 years, and we enjoy living here very much. I work full time as a middle school art teacher, and I've been in the same district for 16 years. Um, I feel truly blessed to have my position and to work with children every day. Um, I'm hoping my experience as a teacher can offer um, the rest of the board members an insider point of view as to what it's like to work in a school. Um, I'm excited about being on the board, and I know if we focus on always doing the best thing for kids, we'll make the right decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight and to the PTA and the League of Voters for organizing this event. Uh, my name is Scott Seaman and I live in Brewster for over 20 years. My wife, Regina, and I have three kids. Uh, one, which is graduated college in 18 days. <laughs> and I have a 10th grade and 11th grade. I've uh, been actively involved in the NJR, NJRPC Boosters and the Performing Arts Boosters, where I was the treasurer, the secretary, and the vice president. My kids have been to many of the programs, and I volunteer as needed, not so much in the sports because I do not have sports abilities. I'm an active parishioner at the St. Lawrence O'Toole Church, where I'm the treasurer for the Knights of Columbus. I'm on the parish council, and I work with the varying groups that have been going through the emergency shelter program and the Thanksgiving group program. Uh, a highlight there was the St. Lawrence Theater Group, which we ran for 10 years. We're not doing it at this time, but it was wonderful event and hope they have to do more uh, theater like they do over at the high school. Um, my wife does a CCD over there and they also serve a training, so I'm sure if anybody does call the server, they get lots of emails from her. Um, most of my professional life I spent in banking, mortgage companies, and auto finance, all industries which weren't doing that well. So now I've uh, moved into the family business. We uh, the family owns a couple of restaurants, the Carriage House up in Patterson, and uh, I work with one over in Manhattan. Uh, working with the board of that, I want to strengthen the schools, continue the transparency that the board has been working on. And this is all of our school board. We need to work together to get the best environment for our teachers, students, and the community. Thank you. Well, thank you both. Yes, thank you. We're going to begin our question and answer section of the program. Uh, Mr. Seaman, since uh, you uh, took the uh, second opening statement, we'll allow you to answer the question first. Uh, the first question to you both is, what do you see as the biggest challenge at the Brewster Central School District? Uh, the biggest challenge, I feel, is the uh, unfunded state mandates. The state determines what has to be done and then tells you to do it. There's a problem funding for it. There's a long history of not getting enough state aid. And sometimes the involvement is decided by politicians as opposed to educators and teachers. So that's why we try to keep it inside, build on what we've done, and continue to work on helping the children. And also that ties tightly into the budget, which is always a point of contention for everybody, because I understand that it's very difficult to live with high taxes. But we have to put from the concept that the money we're using is going to help teachers and our students, including the education. Um, that's a, a very good question. I think that we've, um, we've had a, a few issues in the, the past few years, and I think that um, Brewster has been doing a wonderful job on improving our buildings and our grounds, and um, I think our football field is looking amazing, and um, I think the, the baseball field is looking great. Um, I think that um, unfunded mandates is definitely um, a hurdle that we are going to continue to deal with, and the tax cap um, working within that is, is difficult. Um, I also um, think that we've had some other issues kind of uh, weighing on us in, in the past few years where 
um, I feel like maybe um, our identity or our um, our traditions have changed a bit, and I'd like to see us go back to those and really find out, you know, who we are as a community and and bond together. I think that's the most important thing that we could do right now. Um, what do you both think of as one of the proudest moments or proudest um, characteristics of the Blue District School District? You see? Uh, what sets us apart from other districts is that it's definitely community involvement. And I'll defer to what I know. Uh, our theater group, I believe, is second to none in the county. The uh, things the students and the teachers are able to put on there through our children, it's amazing. It's cool. Um, I love what we're doing with our sports, but um, I'm also really proud of the, the way um, we're advancing with our technology too. The fact that all of our kids have um, laptops to bring home and they can do their homework on those, I think it's been so helpful, um, you know, for, for them getting their work done and for helping parents to stay up to date on what needs to be done and what's happening in the classroom. So that's um, that's one area that I, I, I think research really excelling in. What issues do you believe the district needs to address in terms of its academic programs and offerings? Um, one of the things the board has continued on to this year is rebuilding the science program at the high school. Uh, with the new budget, they're able to add additional people, classrooms, and most importantly, lab time which they have been lacking for as well. Um, also working on getting the proper teachers into the proper rooms to help the kids. Well, I think um, just staying current in the, the 21st century and figuring out what's going to help kids be successful in the future and offering those classes at the high school level. Um, you know, they, they do need business classes um, in the future because most of them, a lot of them are going to be in business. So really, um, Meeting their needs and um, preparing them for the future is, is should be our main goal. And um, we should be in touch with parents to find out, to get their input, and to find out um, the programs and classes they think are appropriate for their children and that we should keep here in our district. What is your understanding of the role of the Board of Education, Mr. Sue? Board of Education is responsible for taking the supervisors and superintendent's vision and helping to distribute it throughout the district, improving uh, policies, procedures, classes, and budget to make sure things are going allocated and keep almost like a back and forth, make sure things are done the way and to speak for the, uh, the community, make sure they, their opinion is heard. I agree. I think of myself as um, representing the community and not my own personal agenda, but to really reach out to other people to see how they feel um, about how things are going on in our district and the things that we need to improve. So I'm looking forward to having that communication with other people and um, to bring that back to the board and to you know find solutions that um, that can work within our budget and um, and. And, and work for everyone. The question that's been reads as follows. There has been much administrative change in the past year in the district, and there are more administrative changes to come. How are you going to go about keeping calm within the district amidst all these changes that are taking place? Well, as long as the, the turnover isn't you know, sudden or uncalled for, it's just a matter of progression. People move through the chain, you work your way through, and they move on. As long as uh, you leave the next generation, the next group behind you, uh, you mentor, you train, you teach on, you be consistent on what we're teaching and, and setting out to the district. Um, I think administrators will look around a lot. Um, principals move around. Um, people that stay are your teachers, and your TAs, and your monitors, and your bus drivers. And um, as long as we keep consistency there, we're going to be okay. Um, I think that we can, we're all adults, we can all work together. And, um, and again, it really comes down to communication. 
and really um, listening to people, their needs and, um, and their wants and, and um, helping everybody get what they need to make our district work. What are you looking forward to most about the superintendent? A new vision, a new direction. Um, everything has been working in one fashion, but just like anything else, somebody coming with a new idea, a new vision, a new thought. What can they bring? I know she had a, um, I want to say a parents' academy they established down in her school district in Jersey, which sounds very interesting. If that's something we can bring up here, that would be fantastic. Um, well, it sounds like actually she has very good experience um, with um, a registration issue that he seemed to have in Brewster. Um, and so I'm looking forward to, to find out how she made that work and um, how she got on board with the rules and regulations that we have as far as um, kids registering and going to the schools in their districts. So I'm grateful that she has that experience and, and I'm looking forward to hearing from her. Um, one of the issues that has been raised uh, lately in education has been school schedules. Uh, many people believe that uh, high school, as students get older and are in need of more sleep, uh, that the high school day begins too early and that the, the younger kids uh, are starting a little bit better. Uh, do you have any views on that issue and would you be uh, interested in studying a schedule change? The uh, superintendents and the teachers would find something like that to be beneficial. Of course, we look into it. Uh, in my opinion, my kids don't sleep enough, and uh, they do too much uh, whatever it is they do. But there's current changes in a number of districts where they have to change the whole concept of the number of periods or the time allocated to the kids. Some of them have turned out and made beneficial, and some of them have been you know, much to the detriment. But it's just something we could definitely look into. I'm actually very interested in that. I, I you know, I worked in an elementary school for um, 15 years, and we started much later in the day. And I found that the kids were really tired by the end of the day. And I, you know, having my own children, I, I know they get up very early, and they're, um, you know, they're the most alert when they first wake up, and they're ready to learn. So I think it would be beneficial for younger kids to come in earlier in the morning, and then the older teenagers who just want to sleep in um, to come in when they're ready. And I think the system we had in place before worked because we had so many teenagers working after school. And I don't think that's the case anymore. I think they're doing activities more often. And that's something that we could tweak and we could um, move around. So. I think a, a change in schedule would work. I'd like to see more studies on how beneficial it's been to other districts before we made any direct changes, but I think that's a great idea. Mr. Cena, earlier you alluded to unfunded state mandates. Um, but the fact is, is that unfunded or not, the state makes requ uh, requirements upon the school day and everything that is that takes place. Um, often that means that um, electives suffer. They're not, able, they're not always able to offer the electives. Uh, do you feel? Do you both feel that the district is doing enough to offer uh, electives and uh, you know, other changes that you would make uh, in that regard? I did see at one of the presentations over the last couple of board meetings where they were talking about new electives, uh, ways to bring uh, carpentry, other items that we've been looking at. We all long for our past back into the school day. I mean, it's definitely something that they started to do, and they can add more to it, of course. Um, there are certain requirements that kids have to meet, a certain amount of math, social studies, English, but there are there should be ways to fit additional electives into the programs. I agree. Um, as an art teacher, um, I think electives are extremely important, and that was something that was very important to me um, when I was younger. And I took all the art classes I could take. Um, one um, area of concern for me, especially, is that um, from what I've heard from my children, or from my daughter specifically, is that the special areas um, teachers are maybe being um, inundated with too many students in their classrooms. Um, 
I don't know what the, the rules are as far as um, numbers are here, but um, you know, I wouldn't want to see any teacher um, you know, overwhelmed with 35 children in the classroom. It just seems like it would be very difficult to teach them. And, um, and so yes, I would like to keep those, those um, options open and um, keep class sizes um, down as much as possible. What are your thoughts on uh, the third through eighth grade testing that's being now done online? I personally am not a fan of the online or computer third through eighth grade testing, or the tests themselves, but I understand the concept behind them. It seems they have worked better in the paper format, than online or with the computers, just like at the last one where there was a giant computer hiccup and everything got bumped today. So the all program which was set up and built to an event, especially in the kids' minds, had to get pushed off, which had to make more difficulty for the teachers and the uh, students. So I'd be not in favor. Um, I'm not a big fan of um, any standardized testing, but um, especially on computers, because there is um, so many problems that can take place. And um, just like Scott said, you know, there was a big issue when the kids were trying to take um, the test a couple weeks ago. Um, I think that it just makes kids really anxious, and um, I'm not sure if they're effective in um, finding out exactly how kids are performing. Um, that is my biggest issue with um, standardized testing. And I believe that every child is an individual, and um, I'm not sure if these tests really prove, um, you know, a, a child's ability. Continuing the theme of the uh, testing, there has been a movement uh, in the last few years for parents to opt out, to uh, have their children refrain from participating in the state testing. Can you give us your opinion of that movement? Uh, to me, opt out is a personal decision. Nobody bet, no, knows their kids better than the parents. Some kids do not perform well in that format, and it's a detriment. Uh, with my kids, I just had them take the tests, and I, to them I told them just another test. We didn't build up to it. Um, it's just there is a lot related to the state side. You know, they're forcing changes. They want to put pressure on the school districts to make them they're pushing. But I don't believe that is really my point or my objective. It's really up to the teachers to try to help, but definitely the parents have to make that decision themselves. I agree with Scott. I think that's a personal decision for um, for you, and um, I made you know different choices for my children, and I think it, it you know, depends on that individual child. And, um, and I also don't believe that you should just opt out um, just to say, we're just not going to do that, and we're not going to conform. There's reasons to not participate, then I think that makes sense. But um, I also think that allowing our children to um, opt out of anything that they don't want to you know, participate in isn't a good idea either. And recently, the New York State Legislature uh, passed a bill that Governor Cuomo signed into law making the 2% tax cap permanent. Can you give us your opinion on the value or uh, harm that that bill will do for the school district? It was both ways. I mean, it's definitely from a Taxpayer side, two percent a week. They get enough money, you know, and you have to limit it. But from the school's perspective, you know, it's more difficult. You have to now balance it. Uh, the TRS, the ERS, um, salaries, budget expenses on insurance, benefits, everything is shooting through the roof. Two percent is not going to keep that forever. It's going to be something that's going to eventually have to come to a head one way or another. But uh, it is the state law now at this time, and I think it's signed it into, so it's something we have to budget with. But it just takes a lot of planning. We're going to have to think forward many years to take into account that it's going to be too, obviously, adjusted by other factors. Like this year, the cap actually is at 4.06. So the 2% figure needs to be explained better to the public. It's not a straight 2% across the board. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. But they're all relevant and they all stay within the camp. Um, I agree. I agree with what Scott said. And I think my biggest issue with the tax cap is that it doesn't allow for um, the 
unexpected. And we all know that that's what life is all about. There's a lot of things that come up and they're unexpected and um, the district is going to have to pay for them. And, um, you know, I think the theory was based on that things are going to kind of stay the same and we have to figure it out, but um, we, we really don't know what the future holds. And so I'm, I think that it might be detrimental to, to all of us in the future and hopefully um, something can change, but, um, but I think it's a difficult thing to work with. Um, earlier we heard about, uh, okay, Mr. Stephen, you talked about uh, the uh, poverty class system that you're bringing in the back. Which begs the question, in the uh, push for the thinking of labor and education has been to try to make every child college ready. Uh, can you give us your thoughts on vocational education, vocational training, and its place, if any, in the curriculum? One of the greatest things I missed from when I went to school was wood shop, metal shop, mechanical drawing, architectural drawing. It's a whole different aspect. And then the most recent program on top of that are phenomenal. Uh, I got out of school, I went to college, I took jobs. Meanwhile, my friend, the Bosis, became an electrician. By the time he was 25, he had a second house. He, the world is running out of people that know how to do things with their hands. So the fact that we need more technical training, we need more training, uh, we need more aspect of the kids to give them other options. Not every person is meant to go to college. The more we're moving into a lot more jobs are college related and do need this training. But the lack of available <coughs> workforce in a lot of these jobs is uh, really going to come to hurt us in a few <coughs> years. And everybody, every kid is different. Every kid has their own thing that makes them shine. And for the lot of it, it's working with their hands. It's technical. It's Writing. It's a lot of things that you won't just get from just going off to school. They need these other experiences uh, to make them the best uh, person they can be. I agree, and, um, and I think that every child brings um, something different to the table and that we really need to cater to that. Um, I also feel that so many people go to college and get degrees and um, they spend thousands of dollars and they never use it. And that's, that's a real issue. Um, I wish there was a way to find out earlier on what kids want to do in the future and really cater their education and high school more towards that. Um, I think that we're kind of only reaching the tip of the iceberg right now, um, but hopefully that's something we can work on and, um, and really help them so that they have a really successful future. It's often said that um, one of the keys to a successful district uh, school system is communication. What is your opinion of the uh, current status of communication within the district, and are there any suggestions that you would make to either improve or change it? I believe the uh, communication of the district has been improving greatly over the last year or two. There's a lot more information out there, there's a lot more information available, and a lot of this has to be to counter lack of a better phrase, false information. Uh, small communities talk a lot. A lot of times what they talk about is wrong. So, and we need to be able to get the information out to people. But people have to feel that you can trust the people that's coming from, trust the sources, trust the people in the school, trust the people bringing up the items. Uh, it's a matter of trust that has to be built and uh, established. Uh, at this time, it is, I believe it's good and it's getting better. And of course, the Everybody's open to finding more ways to get this out. If I could just go back real quick to the previous question. And of course, military service is for a lot of kids, and we need to actually work out 40 in the schools through the Rossi program, just as people know it's an option. Sorry. Um, can you just state that other question again? Because Sorry. <laughs> We're talking about communication. Do you feel oh. that, the, that the level of communication within the district is adequate, inadequate? Um, and are there any changes or suggestions you would make to uh, that system? Um, okay, so well, when we talk about communication, I think about the communication between teachers and parents. Um, I think about the communication between administrators and um, teachers and TAs and monitors. Um, and then I think about the communication that the administrator puts out to, um, to the public. Um, and I think the communication is very good between um, teachers and parents. I think that's going well. 
I'm, I'm not sure how um, the communication is going between the superintendent and the teachers. Um, one issue that I did have in the past couple of years um, was the communication I was receiving um, from the superintendent regarding um, events that were happening within our schools. Um, and those things had to do with threats or, um, or different issues that, um, that were a little um, alarming to parents. Um, I know that there's confidentiality rules and there's um, so much that they can um, offer the public and talk about. Um, but it seems like there was so much being held back that it was almost um, making me more nervous. And um, just recently, I, I saw a change there. Um, I saw a change in the letters that they were writing parents and, um, and allowing um, parents to feel nervous and, um, and, and accepting that and acknowledging their concerned feelings. Um, I think that's, that's important with whoever you're communicating with. Um, so I think we still have a ways to go, um, and I, I honestly think that communication is really the answer to most problems. So hopefully we can make improvements there. Ladies and gentlemen, we're uh, getting down to the final questions that I have here at the podium. If or anybody in the audience has any other questions, would you please take this moment to uh, raise your hand, we'll bring you a card, you can write down whatever questions you may have left. And while you do that, I'm going to uh, go to, to, to my last couple of questions, which I'm going to actually tie together, because I, I think that they, they go together. And some of what they ask, you may have already been looking forward to addressing in your closing statements. But the two questions together are, why do you want to be on the Board of Education? And what will you bring to the Board of Education? wife asks me this question every day. Um, I want to be on the board because there have always been people on the board before me that looked up to my kids. When I was busy working or doing something else, other people stood up and took care of the students. They watched these people and took care of the students and my kids as if they were their own. And I feel that's my turn now to do that for others. That we can all help uh, bring our insight into the schools and to help kids move along and to improve what's been going on within our district, in our town. Uh, the second part. What will you bring to your position? I will bring way too many questions. That's what I will bring. Um, every person should have their own individual perspective on what's going on and how to improve it. Now, through my years in banking and my recent years in restaurant business, I almost look at it like a it's a business experience. How do I improve this for my customers, which are my kids and the students? How do I make it better for them? How do I improve the situations for the teachers? It's all about making things better for everyone. Um, okay, so why do I, I want to be on the board? Um, I want to be on the board because I, um, I feel that it's very important to give back. Um, I feel so grateful to um, have my children and for them to go to these schools and we've had wonderful experiences. Um, I feel super lucky to have my position in my school and to get to make art with kids all day. Um, and because I have so much, I, I want to give back in another way. And um, I think being on the board is an excellent way to do that. Um, and what I think I can offer is I think I can offer my insight as to what it's like to be a teacher and some of the issues that we might be facing. Um, and I was actually really surprised because I went to um, I went to the interest meeting in Pleasantville for um, people interested in being on um, school boards. And for some reason, I when I went, I just assumed that I wouldn't know, um, you know, the things that they were talking about. And I was pleasantly surprised to see that all the questions that were being asked, I I had an answer to or I knew about. So that made me feel more confident in, in being on the board and, and making this decision that's right for me. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, does anybody have any last questions they would like to submit? Seeing none, we are now going to move on to our closing statements. 
And Mr. Smith, since you were so kind as to let Mr. Roy go first with the opening statement, sir, you have a chance to do your statement first time. I want to uh, reiterate what we're looking to do is um, get onto the board, continue the work that's being done, and to make things better for our, our kids and our students. Uh, these kids are living in a world where, uh, not to get sad, but school shootings are commonplace. They don't know any difference. I didn't go through that as a kid. So the stresses and the strains these people are under is uh, incomprehensible. If there's anything we can do to improve their experience in any fashion, you know, we need to do it. Sometimes we have to make a tough to ch choice or something that might not be popular, we have to do it. Um, every kid needs to feel like they belong. They're all Brewster. There are kids, we need to take care of them, give them the blocks to build, uh, to make themselves you know, the best they can be. If that means going off to trade school, that means going off to the service, that means going off to college. They have to be ready. And they need to get ready and we need to help them. And we have to go out of our way and whatever we need to do is what we do. They need to feel this is their home when they're not at home. And I would be looking to maybe see if there's ways we can involve them more in the decisions and the things that we do. Obviously, I'm not going to get checkbook and you know, schools full of video games and vending machines. But whatever they need to and how we can make them think better and do better, uh, we need to do. And from a personal perspective, I want to make my kids as good as they can because they're going to take the nursing home I go into. I want it to be nice and I want them to be prepared. Thank you. Um, well, I agree with what excited to be on the board, mostly just because um, I'm excited about unifying our community. I feel like we've, um, we've had a couple of rough years and um, it's been a bit, you know, divided and um, I'm looking forward to talking to people in the community and talking to teachers and, um, and coming together again. And I think um, that's really what everybody wants. I think that we can get very overwhelmed with what's happening, happening politically. Um, and you know, some of us have gotten carried away, but um, but I think there's a lot of hope for us. Um, and I think, like I said, that we did have um, a lot of traditions here, and, and we need to get back to that. And, and we're so lucky that we have the diversity that we have. Um, and I think that um, I think that we have a really bright future. So, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have a round of applause for our candidates? to once again uh, thank our timekeepers this evening, Phyllis Honig and Jane Weiss of the Department of Council and Women Lawyers. We have a round of applause for them as well. <laughs> On behalf of the Putnam County League of Women Lawyers, we'd like to thank the Brewster Central School District and the members of the PTA for hosting tonight's forum. I thank you all for attending this evening and encourage everybody to go to the polls on Tuesday, May 21st. Uh, the polls will be open from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. and the polling location will be at Brewster High School. So again, thank you very much ladies and gentlemen and have a good evening.